So, hello everybody. Our next talk is an introduction to Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes and it's held by Max. So, please welcome our speaker. Thank you. All right. Can everybody understand me well? Is that, is that fine? Yeah? Okay. Good to go. All right. Uh, introduction to Kubernetes. Uh, today we're going to rethink scalable infrastructure with containers. Let's see how many buzzwords we can put in this presentation. Um, I'm Max. I'm a test engineer at CoreOS. I'm working with the Prometheus team and the Kubernetes team and helping them keeping their quality up. Um, we have an entire hour, so I, I would like to have this as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, feel free to ask during the, during the talk or after the talk. But I'm also here a little bit after the conference, so uh, you can ask me afterwards or reach out to me over any kind of social media or via email. That is appreciated as well. <laughs> okay, um, why is somebody from CoreOS standing up here? And what does CoreOS have to do with uh, containers and Kubernetes? Um, so uh, CoreOS is a company in San Francisco uh, that is also based in New York and Berlin. And um, what we do is we secure, simplify, and automate container infrastructure. And now that, that might not tell you a lot, so I'll just go over some stuff we do. So we, we have enterprise products. Uh, I'll not go into detail at a free and open source conference on our enterprise products. But I want to touch briefly our open source project. That will be Container Linux um, as a Linux distribution, a very minimal Linux distribution that you just run your containers on top. Then Rocket as a container engine. You can think of it as uh, an alternative to Docker. Then Flannel, for example, as an overlay network. Or etcd as a database, uh, which is now pretty much the brain of Kubernetes. Uh, these are our open source projects. We also contribute to a bunch. So that will be Prometheus and Kubernetes. Hope you guys are right if I'm pointing here. I can't really point at both. Uh, so uh, that will be Prometheus and Kubernetes. And um, so we are very involved in upstream projects there. OK, and that's, that's for CoreOS. So uh, what is Kubernetes? That's going to be the, the title and the topic of the talk today. If I want you to take anything with, with this talk, that would be it's a platform for running your applications. That's it. It's nothing very complicated. It's, so whenever you have a chit chat, you can just shoot out that sentence. Uh, but we want to dive a little bit deeper into Kubernetes than just that. So let's first look at what kind of problem is Kubernetes actually trying to solve. And I want to do that with a little example here. So let's just imagine we are a startup and we have that really, really great idea. Uh, we have our phone and we do an augmented reality app. So we walk around in the streets and then we find creatures all over through our phone. We can see them. And then we throw balls at them until we catch them. And uh, we, uh, I don't know, swap, and swap them and fight with them with each other. Apparently, that's very popular. So uh, we got our location service at the very beginning. So that just returns true or false when we give it GPS coordinates. That's very high sophisticated. Uh, and we run that on, on, an, on a normal server, right? We probably put just Debian on it and do an apt get and install all the dependencies. We're good to go. We got our first uh, service running. Um, then in addition, our startup is slowly evolving. Uh, people want more than just a location. So we develop a user service, and we develop an something AppX service. I wasn't creative enough. Um, and we put those on service as well. So now um, we have three applications, each on a separate server, uh, just managing the dependencies via, via apt-get. So it's really easy. Um, not very complicated. And whenever we want to roll out a new version, we take, out, take down the old one and just start the next one. Downtime is not really a problem at the beginning. Now, this is getting really popular. People really like it. And a lot of people are actually running around with their smartphones in their hands. Um, oh, hang on. I'm sorry. Um, so we probably have to scale this. So we don't only need one uh, instance of all of our applications. But we probably need multiple uh, instances of all of our applications. And now slowly, it's getting a little bit more complicated. So first of all, dependency management. How do you do that on all of these servers? Well, you have to keep all the versions uh, under the same, right? 
and uh, whenever you want to roll out a new version, you have to SSH into every single server, take down the application, uh, put on a new application. Now, you probably slowly worry about downtime. You might want reproducible environments, so you want your uh, developers not to say anymore, it works on my machine. Um, then, in addition, uh, you probably want networking in between these services. You want uh, the location service maybe to know where the user service actually is. So do you configure it, hard code it every time you get a new server and put it on there? In addition, you might want monitoring around all of this. So you want to be woken up in the night if something is going very, very wrong. And, and the co plenty of other stuff you want to do here. So it's actually a lot of work. Three servers per app might not be a problem at the beginning, but the more and more you get, it's getting more and more complicated. And maybe that is all developed on a different technology stack, like one is written in Go, one is written in Python, and so on. And suddenly you can't run the location service on the user server and the user application on the location server because the dependencies are simply not there, right? And now it slowly comes to utilization. I want to use as much of my hardware as possible. So maybe the user service does some analysis in the night, but really doesn't need any resources during the day. So that could be taken by the location server. But then again, our dependencies are a problem. So we can't really run our location service on the uh, user server. OK, a bunch of problems. Uh, well, we're here for a solution. So, the suggestion I'm making here is, why will we have specific servers when we can abstract in between them? So we just have servers that are all configured the same, and we have application on top. And we need something in between that does the abstraction for us. Abstracting from hardware, abstracting from network, and abstracting away from processes. And as you might guess, that would be Kubernetes today. And um, today I want to explain what this box is, and so that you can uh, explain to others as well, and maybe even use it or set it up yourself. A little bit about Kubernetes. Uh, we've already had our number one sentence. It's a platform for running applications. It's a platform for running application, abstracting away your infrastructure. That's the basic thing you have to think about when the, the name Kubernetes comes up. A little bit of history. Uh, what is Kubernetes all about, or where does it actually come from? Well, it comes from Google, and it turns out Google actually has a lot of experience running containers. They've done that uh, since a lot of years, and actually a lot of the main technologies that we today use in the Linux kernel to run containers, Linux containers, are contributed by Google. For example, cgroups, the concept of cgroups. So Google has a lot of experience with that, and in 2014 they open source their way how they manage their infrastructure. But they don't do that by open sourcing code, but they do that by open sourcing ideas and learnings. And that is picked up by the community, um, by the instructions of Google, on GitHub, and now it's an open project developed by a lot of companies all together. It's very influenced by Borg, as I said. It's the learnings and uh, ideas from Google. This is the internal monitoring system at the moment, I think, as well. And, um, well, this open source project developed, and in 2015, version 1 was released. And with that version 1, it also joined the CNCF the project. So now it's not part of Google anymore, but it's actually part of the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Google is still heavily invested in it. Uh, their GKE is actually running on this. So it's very important still for them. OK, let's dive into uh, a little bit of details on Kubernetes. And uh, first, want to a little bit grasp, like, what's your experience with it? So here, who has ever, let's say, read about Kubernetes? OK, that's, that's really good. OK, who has ever run Kubernetes or ever interacted with kubectl or something like that? OK, cool. Uh, who's actually using Kubernetes in production right now? One, two, three. OK, three, cool. OK, I hope after this talk, all of you just changing everything. Um, all right, let's go into core concepts, so uh, core components, so you first understand all of this. Well, first of all, um, let's go back to our location service. I wrote that very high sophisticated location service in Go, of course. And um, now, as a good hype-driven development startup, I wrap a container around it. 
And let's hopefully think I don't only read Hacker News, but actually I put some thoughts into this. So what I do is I take my application and put everything that application needs inside that container. That would, for example, be the Golang environment. Um, and from these software containers, what, what is that actually? I talked about C groups earlier. Um, we have namespaces. So the Linux kernel actually has no clue what containers are. That's just a higher level concept that you build from smaller concepts, uh, namely being C groups and namespaces, what can a process see and what can a process actually use. Uh, I'll not go deep into containers today. That's an entire new talk, but I'm, I'm very happy to point you to, towards more information here. Now, um, this uh, meta-level transition is done by, for example, Docker and Rocket, and these are our container runtimes that we can use. What does that help us, this container idea? We've been doing software ever since. Why do we need this suddenly? Well, first of all, portability. I uh, said, I talked about works on my machine problem. Um, you want your, uh, your developers to probably run in the same environment than uh, it is in the end deployed. So now your uh, developers can develop in the same Docker container and have the same versions around. In addition, in terms of operations, it's very important to have everything isolated. We were able to do that on machine level with virtual machines before, but now we can drill a lot deeper and do that on process level. And lastly, we want resource accounting. We want to see who is eating how many resources, and we want to be able to restrict this as well. So all of, this, um, all of these things uh, are combined now in this uh, hype of containers. Now, Kubernetes doesn't stop here. Kubernetes not only wraps a container around our application, but it wraps another concept around it, and that would be a pod. Now, you might be asking, why another concept? Come on, we already have enough. Uh, well, a pod is the, the smallest deployable unit that you can possibly have in Kubernetes. And the idea behind it is sometimes you don't only want to I have one process. So for example, in case of our location server, we might also put a little network proxy in front of it or some logging framework in front of it. So something that has to be deployed with that pod, uh, with that container every single time. So why don't we all put it together in one pod and then we can schedule a pod somewhere. So that's just a simple concept around it. Okay, um, remember this picture, I have to jump a little bit, uh, but we'll come back to that. Okay, so we want to run software. What do we need for that? Of course, hardware. Uh, let's first of all buy a bunch of servers. That's probably a lot of fun. And let's call this one the master server. And a master in Kubernetes, it's just a server. It can be bare metal, or it can be a VM, or you can get really creative. Um, and it needs a Linux kernel. That's the main idea. We need a Linux kernel as a basis, and that could, for example, be container Linux, but that could also be RHEL or Debian and so on. Now, um, on that master, we deploy Kubernetes. And as a user, you could just think of Kubernetes as just that one black box, or in this case, green box. Um, but let's go a little bit into detail. So that thing is called the Kubernetes control plane. And the Kubernetes control plane, um, it has the API server, and it has the controller manager in there, the scheduler, and the kube proxy. I'll go a little bit into detail of each of those components, but just to wrap it up real quickly, the API server is the thing you talk to. The controller manager is actually taking care of all your objects inside your cluster. The scheduler schedules the workload on each node, and the kube proxy, for example, takes care of the networking. We'll dive a little bit into detail there. Running one master is probably boring, so we buy more servers, we buy a, uh, a worker, and uh, that worker, again, is just a bare metal machine, any Linux, and that is actually where our workload was running on. You can still run your workload on the master node, but you probably want to run when you run uh, Kubernetes at a, at a scale of more than just two servers. Okay, here again, we deploy a little Kubernetes. That is called the, the kubelet. It listens to the big Kubernetes, and whenever the big Kubernetes says, hey, please deploy something here, then the little Kubernetes says, okay, I'll, I'll do that, and it starts that up on your worker. Okay, uh, one worker, again, boring. Let's uh, have a couple ones, and ta-da, we have our infrastructure. Cool, we're good to go. Let's deploy some applications on this. 
So Kubernetes has uh, this very declarative style of you interacting with the cluster. You don't really tell Kubernetes what to do or where to get there. You simply describe the state you want to get to, because Kubernetes knows a lot better how to get there than you, because Kubernetes knows entirely what its current state is and how to get to the next one. So what you do is you write deployment YAMLs. You can write deployment JSONs as well. It's just a format in the end. Um, and what you do is you write this deployment YAML, you give it a name, you give it a replica count. So for example, now I want to uh, run three replicas. And you give it a container. The container you would just push to a container registry, like for example, Docker Hub. And um, sorry, I skipped that a little bit too fast. Uh, we give that deployment now to Kubernetes, and namely the Kubernetes API server. And the Kubernetes API server picks it up and saves that. The, the controller manager picks that up and goes over it. Does it work? Then uh, the scheduler sees, oh, there are three replicas, but they are nowhere deployed. So it picks that up. And then it schedules those on the worker machines. Then the kubelets see, oh, something got scheduled on me. And so let's start that on, on me. And that's, that's it. Now you have your applications up and running just by giving that YAML to your Kubernetes server. Now I talked earlier about rolling deployments or how you can now roll your versions in your cluster, which is very difficult if you just have a bunch of bash scripts doing this and if you want to scale there. So in terms of Kubernetes, it's very declarative. You just change the version of your Docker image. Don't forget to push that to a registry and uh, give that to Kubernetes. And Kubernetes knows what to do from here. Uh, and we'll do a rolling release, so slowly move all the parts over to the new version. And that's it. That's all the deployment process. Now you might be saying, okay, the location service, come on, you give it, I don't know, latitude, longitude, and it returns true or false. That's really not difficult. We solved this since years. That's nothing new at all. So everybody can do stateless, and everybody can do stateless applications. And that's what probably Kubernetes really shines at, right? Because it's not that difficult. But stateless is easy, stateful is actually hard. And I don't wanna just talk about stateless application, I wanna go a little bit into stateful applications and how you could possibly run those on Kubernetes. So let's first look at the problem. Um, stateless applications, we don't really care if they die, we can just start up a new one. But stateful applications, for example, here our MySQL database, it, for example, connects to the local uh, disk and writes the, uh, its stuff there. And if this fails, all your data is gone, or you can maybe restart your machine, but you will definitely have downtime, and so on. So I suggest a different approach, and some uh, might look mad at me here. Um, I s propose having network storage, and putting that idea of replicating and so on into your network storage and having uh, just mount points into your server and your MySQL database attaching to that. So now whenever my, my server, let's say, dies, we can just move the disk to a new server and start the process there again, and we're happy. We had a little bit of downtime, but we can optimize that to have it really quickly. That's the main idea how to run stateful applications on Kubernetes. Um, what Kubernetes here introduces is different concepts. First of all, persistent volume. We, in the end, stateful has to be safe somewhere, so we need persistent volumes. That would be network storage. It can either be statically or dynamically provisioned. So the idea is either you give Kubernetes a bunch of disks or you're, for example, running on a cloud provider, and then Kubernetes already knows how to spin up new disks on AWS. And these drivers are for GCE, I think, AWS. There are a bunch of open source projects that you can integrate with. So there's a huge community around that. And of course, we have a new concept, not deployment YAMLs, but now we have stateful YAMLs. Um, and these are just for stateful applications. And the key takeaways here is, well, stateful, um, unique network identities. I'll go into detail how that works. And persistent storage, of course. Now, your application in a stateless environment you don't really care what application it is and uh, where it lives. But in a stateful environment, we actually can't really care about that. So how would this look like, again, in the Kubernetes idea? Well, you give that the stateful YAML, and you can look at this. We uh, the change here is that we have a volume claim template. 
and thereby you describe to Kubernetes what does my application need. So in this case, we need a storage class of anything that could be SSD or spinning disk, but I was not very specific here. And let's say one gigabit. And then Kubernetes deploys your MySQL, for example, somewhere, starts the process, and uh, mounts the disk in there, and you're good to go. Let's go through a failure example. This thing dies. Uh, then you can just start up a new one on the same node. Let's say the entire node dies, or I don't know, you cut a cable or something. Then you can just start this process on a different worker and mount the same disk in there. And now I talked about network identities. The network identity moves from the upper one down to the lower one. So your applications really just notice the downtime, but they don't notice that their entire data is gone as it's not. Okay, cool. Um, this is for basic stateful applications. There's also the idea of operators. I went through that a little bit to my previous talk. The idea is that we have all that knowledge around how to operate stateful applications, which is really difficult. And then people put that knowledge into code and wrote operators. And that would, for example, be the etcd operator or the Prometheus operator. OK, do we got any, any questions so far? I'll still cover the network part, don't worry. Mm -hmm. OK. How do you repeat the question? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. Uh, so how do we apply the concept of pods here in this scenario? And um, here in this scenario, pretty much containers and pods are the same. Um, we just care about our process, right, at the beginning. It's just one MySQL process. You don't have any sidecars next to it. And here, that container would just be in a pod, and there would just be one container in that one pod. And then you would mount the volume into the container itself. Um, let's imagine, for example, we want more logging around this. So for example, we want to log whenever there was a request to our MySQL database. Then we might not want to change the MySQL source code, but we want to deploy a little application next to it. We would just place it in the same pod inside a new container and then we would have two containers in one pod. Does that, does that explain it? You're hesitating. Um, so uh, I always have the use case that I want multiple instances of one application yeah. and multiple instances of another application, yeah. but the numbers are different, uh -huh. and they interact ah. with each other. Then you don't put it in the same pod. Only if the numbers always match, right? If you have an application that always lives with the, uh, with this, the other application, you always deploy it in one pod. If the numbers are not equal, you don't do that. It's probably a good, um, yeah, and there. All right, um, yeah, I'll, I'll move on to networking, and then uh, we can go on over questions again, and then uh, I'll go in more expert details on Kubernetes. Okay, we got the, the operators covered, right? And now um, I talked about networking. And that is actually a huge pain. It's not only storage, but also networking in total. And uh, the problem is our pods can really move around in our architecture over and over and over again. They can die and come back, and we don't really know about it. We don't want to know about it because Kubernetes manages a lot better and a lot faster than we do. But the problem is how do we tell one pod to communicate to another pod if they really don't know where the other pod is? If, is it, if it's such a fast-moving infrastructure. So here we introduce the idea of services. You can think of services as pretty much just a proxy in front of it, and it basically just groups the pods. So for example, if I have the location pod, and I deploy three of those, so I have three location pods, then I put this location service in front of that, and whenever another application needs to talk to my location service, I just point it to that service, and I don't really care which part that a specific application is talking to. I just want it to talk to the type location. Um, these services, the idea is it you create the service, and the service will keep the static IP inside your cluster at all time. 
and it will, you can obtain that IP as a different application by environment variables or DNS. You probably want to start off with environment variables uh, which are automatically mounted in your pod, but uh, you probably want to go over to DNS soon. So how does this work, and how can one IP address be in the entire cluster, and how can I call that IP address from everywhere and still talk to different pods? That's a little bit strange and crazy. We don't do any port matching here in Kubernetes because every container has its own IP in the end. So let's say we want to have a front-end pod, and that talks to our back-end. And um, somehow the front end needs to talk to it, so it goes over the network, and it just does a request to it. It read the IP address in the environment variables inside the container, and now does a, I don't know, a ping to that IP address. So what actually happens here? The service, the front end service, really doesn't know anything about what happens, and it doesn't need to know about anything. So it thinks, it just talks to the IP address, and something is answering from that IP address. But what is actually happening underneath is we build um, a virtual network on top of our normal network. And uh, the Q proxy, where all the traffic goes through, um, talks to the API server, um, gets the pod IPs of that service IP, and writes that into IP config rules. And now the Linux kernel does the load balancing of translating a service IP into pod IPs. So the, our front end doesn't know anything. It just talks to that service. And the Linux kernel automatically translates to all the other IPs. And now this would look like that. Um, it would just, for example, pick the, the first one if we do round robin, and would just talk to the first worker. And the next time, it might even talk to the next one. So that is very random in, st in terms of stateless applications. OK. <laughs> Um, how can you get started on this entire Kubernetes idea? Um, well, first of all, I think to, to really try it out in a quick way, you can just start up Minikube. Minikube is really nice. As it's just a VM on your computer, and it's a single node cluster. You're up and running right away, and you can deploy your stuff in there. Of course, you're bound by the requirements uh, or your resources by, of your laptop. Then next is Chorus Tectonic, which I want to talk a little bit about in a, in a minute, if I still have time. And of course, there are hosted versions like GKE or Cube ADM that you can use to spin up Kubernetes clusters. OK, uh, let's do a real quick recap, then I'll go over questions. And then if there are still people interested, I can tell you about more um, ways how to um, <coughs> run Kubernetes in a different way. So our sentence again, Kubernetes is a platform for running applications. Uh, you have your application, you wrap that in a container, you can wrap multiple containers in one pod if they are still always present with each other. That is your infrastructure, you have a master, you have the control plane on the master, you have kubelets on the workers, you build that infrastructure, you write deployment YAMLs and give that to Kubernetes, and you write stateful set YAMLs and give those to Kubernetes. In the end, Kubernetes is just a protecting away your infrastructure. All right. OK, cool. Um, yeah, I'll go into questions now, uh, if you still have some. And uh, yeah, please, go for it. You talked about the stateful uh, Yes. Um, aren't the you, you, you mounted uh, the volume to this container? Yes. Aren't there problems by scaling this? By scaling this. Because, because of right. Yes, I'll repeat the question. <laughs> Uh, because of write applicant, can you can you go a little bit more into detail? Like, so, um, if the two containers want to write on this volume, mm -hmm. only one container can write it, right? Because of the uh, um, of the exclusion. Okay. So uh, the question is, uh, do we have what happens if we have race conditions? If we have two containers mounting the same volume and then and again uh, the same writing at this. Well, first of all, Kubernetes, I think, cannot solve everything. There's probably a solution for that situation out there that some users solved. But I think the idea is you don't really want to have two MySQL databases writing to the same file system. Or if you do, you really want to, them to write into different uh, folders or something like that. So you have to take care of that race condition. And what I would suggest is you really have two uh, network storages that you can attach to one container. So each container has its own network drive. Yeah, but uh, then there are, isn't the, the, the one um, status of the database because you have two different... 
I hope you replicate your data not this way, but actually by talking with each other between the database. I think uh, let's let's go into detail uh, afterwards. I think there are a lot of uh, different scenarios how to do that. Yeah, um, yeah sure. Please. Um, you said the Kubernetes will build its own uh, virtual network. Is that? Uh, you have to build it yourself, but I'll, uh, if we still have time, I can show you a project where you can just run one command and it builds everything for you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not one command. <laughs> All right, I don't know who, who was first. Sorry. Uh, go for it, please. So would be a follow-up. How does, the, does it build the network automatically? How to magically? Okay, let's let's push this question a little bit back, and I'll talk about how CoreOS thinks is best how to bring up Kubernetes clusters. Okay, All right? Yes. Okay. Do I always uh, deploy a service in front of a pod? Uh, it really depends. If, for example, if you have a batch job, and that batch job nobody needs to talk to that, then you don't really need a service in front of it. But uh, whenever you need to talk to that thing, you probably want to service in front of it. It's a full different story around stateful applications. But I, uh, yeah, I can't co cover everything in the talk. Feel free to reach out afterwards. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you? It's acoustically difficult. Okay. Um, so the the question was, do I? Um, what happens if I have a local local disk local volume claim, and um, now my my node dies, and now I have to move it to a different uh, node, right? Um, so I, I think I probably mis uh, explained that the wrong way. Let's go back a little bit. So you don't have local storage, but can I go fast enough? You have network storage, right? So uh, you don't really, you don't care about the, the hard drive on your node, on your machine, but you let that be managed, for example, by S3 or something by your cloud provider or something you built yourself with open source solutions. And then uh, you mount your network drives into it. So whenever now this node dies, we have never written to the local disk, so we can just move the application to a different server and mount the same network storage in there. And we, uh, we don't have to care about moving the data. Sorry? OK. All right, OK. <laughs> um, I'll just go into a little bit of details how Chorus runs this. And if there are still questions, I'm around afterwards. I think that's probably more helpful. Um, let's go. <laughs> I'm sorry with all the slides. Um, so we are contributors to the upstream project of Kubernetes, and we have a very opinionated way how to run Kubernetes. And so we know how to make it most resilient as possible. And I want to cover really quickly how we do that. So the, the one-click solution that I proposed earlier, I might have over a little bit, but um, it is the tectonic installer. Uh, don't be uh, afraid of the word tectonic in here. In the end, you can still spin up just a vanilla Kubernetes cluster with it. Uh, so it is the, the core as way how to run Kubernetes. And uh, it is actually built with Terraform. I don't know, probably a lot of people are familiar with Terraform. It's a very nice way how to integrate with pretty much any provider. So you can extend it nicely. Uh, we're right now supporting AWS Bare Metal Azure. Uh, there is. Uh, code for OpenStack, and there's going to be support for VMware. So what does this installer actually do? Well, it does. Uh, it starts up Kubernetes in a very special way, and that is the idea of self-hosted. Is anybody familiar with self-hosted compilers, for example, or self-driving compilers? Have anybody ever heard of that? <coughs> so the idea is uh, if you write your own language, uh, in the end you can compile your own language with your own language. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem here. And what we do is we self-host Kubernetes. So um, 
the idea of Kubernetes is you have your application and now you can nicely scale it up and down. You have great tooling around it. If it dies, we just restart it. Now, why don't we just don't not just do it with our applications, but also with our cluster? And that's the idea of self-hosted. So we run Kubernetes inside itself in the Kubernetes. Now, that's a chicken and egg problem. And uh, I think over there is sort of someone quite surprised. And I'll go into detail how that works. But first of all, we have different stages. So for example, DNS and add-ons, that's easy to deploy on your own cluster. It's in the end just a deployment. Then it's getting more difficult at level three with scheduler, controller, and proxy because try to schedule a scheduler without a scheduler. That is really difficult. Uh, and then the second level where we are at right now with the Tectonic Installer is the API server uh, started by the same API server. Then you can go experimental with etcd and you can go crazy with kubelets, but we are not there uh, actually self-hosting kubelets. So how does this work? Well, it's an open source project. It's called Bootcube, and it helps you running Kubernetes inside Kubernetes. And I want to go through the steps how this actually works. So on your machine, um, you have your kubelet. Uh, kubelet just being the, the daemon that can, in the end, spin up containers. And that's all that Bootcube needs at the beginning. You can think of Bootcube just as a script, just creating stuff. So first of all, we spin up a normal Kubernetes cluster. It might be difficult, but if you automate it, that's actually pretty quick. Um, and it spins up a temporary etcd cluster, a temporary API server, and temporary scheduler. These are just our temporary components, just to bootstrap stuff. Once we have that, on that Kubernetes cluster, on our bootstrapping Kubernetes cluster, we start our actually production running Kubernetes cluster. So we start an additional etcd cluster, we start an additional API server, we start an additional scheduler, and so on. Now, this API server sees the temporary API server and sees, oh, there are two, so I'm not going to do anything, right? It just idles around. We do leader election by default, so it doesn't really do anything. This is just sitting there. The same is with the etcd and the scheduler. Now, what we can do is move all the data, so all the, the brain of Kubernetes, from etcd over to the long-running etcd. And then we can kill the temporary server, the production API server meant, uh, sees, oh, there is no other API server. I better take over from here. And then it takes over. And now you have your Kubernetes cluster running inside your Kubernetes cluster. Um, you might be asking why. <laughs> See a lot of confused faces here. Uh, well, first of all, we have small dependencies. Um, we run our stuff how we run our applications. Um, we have deployment consistency, as I said. Um, we can run everything the same way. We have e uh, easy introspection. Kubernetes brings a lot of tooling how to introspect into your applications. And now, in addition, you can easily introspect into your cluster itself, like, for example, metrics or logging and so on. Then you can easily do cluster upgrades. I don't know, and a lot, a lot of people here are running Kubernetes in production, but it's actually a huge pain how to update it, right? So uh, cluster upgrades are just like application upgrades. You change your deployment YAML and give that to Kubernetes, and that takes the rest. <laughs> and uh, in addition, we have easier high availability modes. So for example, we can scale our API server now. We can scale our applications. We can also scale our API server. Now, this high availability we achieve by leader election, as I said. If the one scheduler sees, oh, there's still the temporary API, uh, scheduler, I won't do anything. And we do checkpointing. So, for example, we, we checkpoint the API server every now and then onto disk. So whenever a node, for example, restarts, we can start up that same API server again. That is, for example, how you could now update your Kubernetes cluster. You just use your tooling that you use for Kubernetes and just edit your API server, and from there you go. Okay, that's my, my end about the more specific Kubernetes class. Um, I think there are a bunch of questions around that. I'll just finish my slides, and then you can ask questions around that as well. All right, so uh, we're hiring. If you want to get involved in San Francisco, New York, and Berlin, 
We are hiring for interns as well, for Prometheus developers upstream, for automation engineers, for test automation engineers, pretty much uh, all over. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out. And I think now is time for questions. I still have 20 minutes, is that right? Okay, I, I'm going to repeat the questions. <laughs> all right, yes, please. I would not call it war, but yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in your opinion, uh, what's the difference? Uh, so, I think you already mentioned what's um, the main difference between uh, you show and the other ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what, why would I use Tectonic Installer? Why don't I just use Bootcube? Why don't I use Boot? Uh, why don't I use Cube ADM and all the other tools? Well, they all have their ups and downs, and I can't really represent the other tools here. Um, for sure, check them all out. Don't just go with Tectonic Installer. Um, Tectonic Installer, as I said, we know how to run Kubernetes. So the entire idea of self-hosted, you get by Tectonic Installer, and you get the whole story of you get CoreOS underneath, CoreOS Container Linux underneath, um, so you don't need to buy any other operating systems. Um, so you get the whole package of CoreOS in Tectonic Installer. I think uh, Cube ADM is probably a more basic approach and <clears throat> less opinionated to the entire package. But uh, there are probably a lot of blog posts around comparing those tools. I, I don't think I do a good job comparing them here. No. Okay, other questions? Um, what's the biggest yes. you are running? Number of nodes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are load, uh, load testing this a whole lot. But um, as you know, we're a production company. We're the product company. We're not actually hosting this. I'm, I'm not able to talk about my clients here. Our clients, I'm sorry. OK, yes. Did I understand correctly that under the hood, you are uh, using Terraform in your tech, uh, your, uh, installer, tech uh, So are we using Terraform in our Tectonic installer? Um, yes, we are. And that is, um, we chose that on purpose so that people, we don't just give them Tectonic Installer and they um, can only run our version, but they can actually adjust all of this. It's all open source, you can play around with the Terraform, and it's in the end just Terraform code. Yeah. Does it mean that you generate Terraform um, scripts that, that can be an intermediate platform you use? Or uh, no. Just do we generate Terraform scripts? No, we don't. We don't do any macro programming here. We just leverage Terraform itself. So we use Terraform, right? And you can extend it. You can, you can clone the GitHub repo and use it as well. We have a UI installer as well, if you want to go through that. It's probably easier at the beginning. Yeah, so that helps you bringing up a cluster in AWS, for example. Yeah. OK, other question? Yes, please. So in your YAM file, you are defining uh, replica. Mm -hmm. So this basically means how many uh, containers you will run with uh, certain application. Mm -hmm. Now the question is um, how they are distributed across the across the workers. Because from high availability perspective, you will if you will put all the replicas on one worker and he's out, then you are increasing your uh, outage. This mm -hmm. worker is out. Can you influence somehow? So um, if I uh, adjust my replica count, can I say that it's not supposed to run on, on one node? Or can I say that my database nodes please run on this really high storage nodes and so on? Um, yes, for sure. There are taints and uh, a lot of concepts in Kubernetes that you can actually adjust to specify where what should run. And for example, you can also adjust. For example, we don't want three API servers and all of them running on the same node. So we can specify, hey, um, if there's one API server, don't schedule a second API server on the same node. So you can do a lot, taints and tolerations. Um, yeah. All right, any other questions? Yes, please. Can Kubernetes handle applications that are clustered and synchronized via caches? What would be the problem? Why not? Uh, 
Okay. Um, it's in the end, uh, there's no real like it's just a virtual network. So in the end, it's just a network that you can use and leverage yourself. But you have to pay attention, of course. Uh, you have to talk to the service now, right? Not just to single pods, or you have to take, uh, talk to the stateful set. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, we can go into detail afterwards as well if you want. Um, okay. Other questions? None. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm here a little bit longer. If you want to reach out, uh, I think uh, the only thing that you need to know is the basic stuff. I hope I didn't confuse you too much about the complicated stuff and the self-hosted idea. All right, thank you very much for the attention and thanks for the FOSTEM team.